Ash. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, I encourage all of you to have your videos on, uh, but please remember that it's being recorded, so if you're not comfortable with that, you can keep it off. And quick housekeeping announcements. Um, the questions that we'll be asking in this session are based on the questions that we received before the session. But in case you have any questions that you'd like to ask, I would encourage you to be putting those in chat. And then if we have some time at the end, or if we think that a question we're asking is related to um, a question that you share on chat, we would also love to take those questions live. So I would really encourage um, you to just be active in the chat as well. We will be monitoring that. Okay, so um, I think let's begin. I will start by introducing Madhulika, who is our moderator, and then she'll introduce Professor Dupa and then take the session forward. So Madhulika is an economist uh, whose research interests uh, lie around gender, health, and education. She is a PhD candidate at, uh, in economics at the department at Georgetown University and a research fellow at EPOS. Her current work involves overseeing research activities on a portfolio of gender and financial inclusion projects. And prior to her PhD, she worked at, with the Social Observatory, an interdisciplinary team of researchers at the World Bank Development Research Group, and provided technical assistance for livelihood projects in India. Welcome, Madhulika, and over to you. Thanks a lot, Prerna. And firstly, I'd like to congratulate you and your colleagues for putting this session together. We're really looking forward to hearing Dr. Dupas talk about her experience. Um, we're really, really pleased to have Dr. Dupas with us to share with her, uh, share with us her journey as an economist. Um, Dr. Dupas is a professor of economics at Stanford University and a senior fellow at the Stanford Institute of Institute for Economic Policy and Research. She is the director of Stanford King Center on uh, Global Development. Her work focuses on challenges faced by the poor households in developing country, and her diverse body of work spans themes like health, education, gender, financial inclusion, governance. And for me personally, your 2011 paper, uh, the Kenya paper on uh, giving information to adolescents about HIV risk was like one of those papers that was an aha moment that it makes so much sense. So we're really looking forward to this conversation. And I will kick off the conversation with the most cliched question that you probably get in these, uh, uh, in these interactions, which is that, could you tell us a little bit about your journey as an economist? Like, how did you, when did you decide to be an economist? What was the journey like? And more specifically, the journey to be a development economist? Okay. Well, first of all, uh, thank you so much for having me. It's a great pleasure to, to be here. I understand not everyone can be on camera because of connection challenges, but I appreciate seeing uh, at least a few of your faces. Um, so uh, I guess my journey as an economist is nothing uh, uh, kind of exciting in the sense that um, it's not at all a calling. <laughs> uh, I had no idea what it meant to be an economist, let alone a development economist, for quite a while. Um, no one is an academic in my um, extended family, no in any of my uh, networks. Uh, none of my parents' friends were academics, so I didn't know what it meant at all to be an academic. I didn't know what it meant to be a researcher. Um, and I ended up studying economics uh, kind of because of um, some kind of almost random situation where I went through a the education system in France, which is kind of, um, uh, you know, very elitist. And um, as long as you're doing well in the system, you kind of like go along with it without really, you know, deciding for yourself. And so I ended up at a juncture where I was uh, in what's called preparatory classes after high school, where you prepare for highly competitive exams. Uh, I guess you guys are familiar with that for those of you in India, because it's not so far from it. You know uh, what you have for high, high administration, and for that you you know I had to take classes in many subjects, um, you know math and um, uh, history, literature, philosophy, uh, and it, it was extremely extremely hard um, hard work, and the professors were extremely harsh. Um, and the one topic where the professor was really lame was economics. He was really not a good professor, and so as a result, we didn't learn much. But most of all, I didn't get fed up with it because all the other subjects I was learning, you know, I was doing so much of it that by the time I was done and I, you know, 
um, I, I was lucky to be one of the those who, who made it to the you know uh, prestigious United school where you when you get enough of a good grades. I was lucky to get in, but I was I was fed up with everything else. <laughs> Um, and so I, I continued uh, on uh, doing a bit of philosophy because I thought that was, uh, that was cool. Uh, and economics, just because I felt like that's the one topic that I'm not yet, uh, you know, completely fed up with. And then quickly I, you know, realized philosophy, uh, that's not something I was good at. I was a good consumer of it, I liked learning, but I was not really, uh, you know, I, 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 I couldn't uh, think I was going to be able to, you know, come up with some new, you know, really insightful things. So I decided okay economics at least you know it's something that's very practical um but i really didn't know what it meant to be a researcher in economics i in france it, at the time it was still you know people would write books so i thought of being an economist mean like you write a book um then uh you know we would read the economist uh, with some you know friends um and i thought that was kind of really useful uh analysis i was kind of learning from that but the the schoolwork that what we were doing in the masters um it was all like very theory it was micro theory and micro theory does you know, almost nothing to do <laughs> with what you know with the practice of it um and so i was just like you know studying was what i was been doing all along i was you know 23 24 i was good at studying i could you could put me in front of any thing and i would just do it and be okay with it but it was no you know and then finally I reached a point where, okay, I'm done with my master's and what's the next step? And then, okay, because I was in this um, prestigious institution in France, I could, you know, get the scholarship to go to Harvard as a visiting student. So I go there and I'm auditing grad classes. And uh, I took a class by Michael Kramer and Esther Duflo. Michael Kramer was at Harvard, Esther Duflo was at MIT, but they were jointly teaching the development sequence. By then I was interested in development, but I don't know why. And my master's thesis was, um, on the in, on Indonesia, I guess it was around 1997 when there was um, a crisis there, and somehow it made the news, and I got interested. But I, so I don't quite know why. I, I don't remember why I was interested in development. But anyway, I took their class, and then I finally had the courage to say, you know, I would love to get um, a job as an RA. I would love to go to the field. And you know, they were desperate. They needed somebody. I was the only one available. <laughs> and I said, okay, fine. We don't know you, but we hire you. So that was like the luckiest thing ever because then they just left, you know, in the middle of the school year, I left Harvard, I left my scholarship to go live in the middle of nowhere in Kenya uh, to work as an RA for Michael Kramer um, and Esther Duflo and Ted Miguel who was also, um, you know, I started working there as well with them. And, you know, until then, I had no, I really had no idea. I mean, I just, you know, th then I realized, oh, actually there's something, you know, this is really, this is related to, to real life. This is, this is concrete. Um, Obviously, there are a lot of issues uh, that people are facing, you know, everywhere around the world. But the issues that uh, poor folks in Sub-Saharan Africa and especially in Kenya, where I was, um, I, you know, suddenly like I could relate to them uh, very well. I was living with a Kenyan family, uh, and I was like, oh, I can see how um, it's not obvious <laughs> uh, what to do. It's not obvious that you know if you do this type of program or that type of program is going to make a difference and everything is interconnected and you want to improve you know people's health but if they don't have education you know how do you communicate effectively uh why certain health behaviors are going to be important also so it's just then you know initially i was so kind of enthralled by the concreteness of being there and, and being with people and learning so much from people all the time uh learning like i, I felt like well, I don't know what's the right thing to do, but if I ask this, you know, poor lady by the side of the road selling tomatoes, what would make a difference in our life? She knows. <laughs> so initially, I was like, maybe we don't need research because we can just ask people. Um, and then, and so initially, I was like, well, that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to, you know, stay here forever um, and, you know, do whatever I can to help and, um, you know, utilize my privilege, uh, uh, then being born in a rich country to like, bring in more resources here. But then after after a while, I, I realized that a lot of the NGOs around um, they they were doing great jobs, but but they were very focused on one thing. And like, okay, I'm gonna do microcredit. I'm gonna do microcredit. I'm gonna do microcredit. And others like, I'm gonna do HIV. I'm gonna do HIV. <laughs> and I realized that for me, that this was gonna be um, not enough to just be you know 
one thing one thing i wanted to make a difference and uh, you know i mean knowing that you know there was very little i could do but uh, i wanted to feel like uh, i'm not um kind of like stuck to one thing because you know the problems that people face change all the time and so so it took me a while so maybe after like nine months in kenya uh that's when i felt like well maybe maybe what i want to do is to be, 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 be a researcher and maybe maybe i should go back and do the phd um but so it's only then so i was like 25 26 by then that's only when i, I really understood what it means to um to, to do to do to do to do research um and but then i still didn't know exactly what it meant to be an academic that you only realize once you're a professor what exactly this entails is very kind of odd and at the same time wonderful job um so yeah so, so, so there's no you know the bottom i'm sorry it's a very long answer but the bottom line is that there is no calling there is no oh ever since i was three you know <laughs> um there is no realization, oh my God, this is the best discipline. I don't think it's the best discipline. I think I would have been very happy being a doctor. My parents didn't want me to be a doctor because I was too good in math. They didn't want me to go to medical school, um, which you know I still, <laughs> to this day, uh, resent them for because they are both doctors. So is my sister, so is my brother. You know, everyone is a doctor. I always thought it was a wonderful profession. And in this moment, you know, especially, we're all very grateful to the medical profession. So I would have been terribly happy being a doctor. I think I, I would be terribly happy being a um uh you know a sociologist or an anthropologist now that i know more about all these things i, I think all these disciplines are wonderful um and yeah that's <laughs> i just happened to meet really uh, in, uh inspiring people in economics uh at the point in life where i had to kind of decide and that's why i'm here that's a lot like many of our journeys where we stumbled upon economics and realized that it's not about stock markets and sort of realized that this is something that we enjoy the most. And like for a lot of my younger colleagues, poor economics would have happened around the time when they were starting college and that would have sort of told them that what economics is about and like all, what economics is also about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, in fact, I, mean, I think there's an issue with the way we teach, um, you know, econ, econ 1. Um, I mean, I'm planning to for I already committed for next year to to start teaching Econ One, but I'm planning to create a new <laughs> version of it that's um, much more you know related to what we actually do. <laughs> so, yeah, um, yeah, so yeah. if you have any suggestions or ideas, you know, please email me and send me because I want it to be like really you know um, kind of introducing the discipline as you know as you know all of us on this call uh, know it and uh, and love it uh, which has nothing to do with with people's uh, uh opinion i mean you all know when you get into a taxi uh, taxi in new york and you say you're an economist they want you to you know help you help them think about you know <laughs> uh stuff that you're like well no the i don't know anything about the stock market <laughs> We'll expect over 60 emails in your inbox today. Great. <laughs> so the next question is about during a journey in grad school, many of us will go to grad school. Some of us are already in grad school. And when we're making that transition from being a student to being a researcher, it's a strange transition because being a student is something that comes naturally to us. We've been doing this all our lives. So could you talk a little bit about when you were transitioning to being a researcher? You had already done some RA work, so you had some prior experience of doing research and like figuring out exactly this is what I'm really passionate about. How was that journey like? Yeah, so I I um I kind of I didn't do a traditional uh, path. Uh, after I decided to you know do the PhD, I actually chicken out of doing the PhD in the US. Um, I was like scared. I was like, wow, I have to write an essay about myself. You know, in France, we don't do that. You just, you have a competitive exam. You don't, there's nothing like, you know, uh, about writing an essay and they, they, that's, that's, so I had no idea how to do that. Um, and also I was scared. I was like, am I gonna go back and do this first two years of exams? You know, I had been, I had spent a year in the field and then I spent another year working, you know, as an RA from um, from MIT and BR and being in the field almost all the time. It's been, it had been two years, uh, uh, even like 
no, I mean, like three years, I guess, without taking exams and stuff. And I, I felt like uh, I'm done with that. <laughs> um, I don't want to go back to that. So I didn't do the traditional path. In, instead, I went and signed up as a physician in France, where I had already done the master. So I was just, I just had to write a dissertation. Um, I mean, it was, it was not a smart move. I shouldn't have done that. I would, I should just have, you know, um, bit the bullet and, and done the PhD. But um, but nevertheless, despite that, um, there was still, a, there was still, um, so I guess not. So, so on, on the question of the transition from being a student to being a researcher, that, that I didn't have to, you know, so, you know, struggle through that because um, I was involved in, in the field work and I was in, I, initially you start your NRA and you're working for uh, other people and then, um, and then you you slowly uh, start you know becoming yourself kind of like a PI as we say principal so you start you know being also yourself uh, involved on the project as a researcher not just as an array and that that kept me busy um, where I was struggling was in coming up with my my own ideas um, I think that would be entirely mine you know for your dissertation you need to have your own stuff and for that I was kind of struggling because. Uh, by then, which was, uh, you know, around you know, 2003, 2004, and maybe still now, there was this sense that, you know, if you just do, you know, field work, if you just do an RCT, and there's no theory, like, what is that? Like, that's not economics, you know, and you need some math, you need some Greek letters, otherwise, who are you? And, and so I was struggling with that, and, you know, my husband makes fun of me all the time, because he said, you remember those days <laughs> when you were, like, trying to write models about stuff that was not interesting? Um, and so I, I, you know, on the one hand, I was like busy almost, you know, 40 hours a week working on this existing product I was very excited about. And then the rest of the time, you know, I was uh, trying to do stuff that fits with what I perceived as being what was demanded, demanded of me. And the struggle was to realize, you know, that doesn't make sense. Like, I don't have to write a model just for the sake of it. I should write a model if I fa face, you know, an empirical fact that I cannot explain with existing models. Um, or I should write a model if I, you know, feel that there is some uh, uh, mechanism out there in the world that's very important and that has not been modeled yet. Um, and that was not the case at the time. <laughs> you know, there was no puzzling fact that needed an explanation, a theoretical explanation at the time. Instead, you know, all the time I was spending in the field and, um, you know, with my, with my Kenyan friends, I, I was, you know, coming up with a lot of, um, uh, you know, empirical challenges that people were facing and uh, concrete ideas as to what could be, could be done about that. So like, you know, the telling girls about well, the risk of HIV, um, it made me laugh when you said the 2011 paper because I actually did this work in 2004, 2005. That was part of my dissertation. It just took me forever to publish it. But um, and so then I, finally, you know, I, I, I at some point I just realized, okay, I don't care what other people uh, think. You know, I'm just gonna do what I think is important and what I enjoy doing. Um, and 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 maybe I won't get a job as a professor of economics. Uh, for that, but that's okay because I can do some other stuff, you know, and uh, uh, there are other positions for me where I would be able to do exactly what I think is um, relevant and, and uh, that I'm happy to do. And so when I finally <laughs> let go, uh, that's when, you know, I went on the job market with this HIV paper, which talked about, you know, cross-generational sex um, and, you know, anal sex and stuff like that. <laughs> and I was, you know, interviewing, you know, hotel rooms with mostly old white men uh, were like very uncomfortable with um, talking about sex all the time and it made for kind of a weird job market experience but I got one job which is all you need and it was a wonderful job um, and the, the, the folks who hired me I knew they hired me because they actually really cared about the work I was doing um, so if you don't if you just if you present yourself for what you are then you know that people who accept you accept you exactly for what you are and it took me a while to realize what I, what I am is uh, someone who um, is good at, um, you know, uh, kind of listening to people's um, grievances and uh, suggestions and then, you know, finding the resources uh, to try them out. Uh, 
and and doing it kind of like relatively well so that's that's i'm good at that so that's what i do it's actually answered the next question that i had on my list which is the question that i had added which is that when you're in academia often development is seen as a soft sub discipline and that's a lot of times you get that in seminars and so on and like did you ever experience that and you have already partially answered that based on your experience and what advice no sorry go ahead and what advice would you have for people who are aspiring to go to phd programs and they're interested in development and they care about it and they're passionate about it but if they come across those things like what should they remind themselves to sort of stay in the correct headspace well so first you know soft is good you know honestly it's like what's wrong with being soft i mean that's like okay. <laughs> um um the I think the, you know, it's 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 very difficult to 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 write a dissertation on a topic that you're not passionate about. Okay. Um, and in fact, and, and even even in you know uh, even in in you know the, the work that I do, which I'm passionate about, it takes forever to publish a paper. And often, by the time you know the paper is finally out, I'm like, you know. And, and, and at, you know, at some point you're like, okay, I've learned uh, everything that I, I could learn from this. I've like made the results available to the people who can learn from it. The actual <laughs> publications, you know, doesn't matter anymore. And so, um, and so, so even when, you know, I care deeply and still I, I find it very difficult to like go all the way through the finish line. So imagine if you don't actually care that much and you're doing something just because you think that's what other people want you to do. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, there is no point. <laughs> you're you're going to be miserable. So it's important, you know, to remember that. Like, do something that you want to do. Like every day, when you sit in front of your computer or your, you know, you pick up the phone to be on a call or you know, you design a survey. Like, are you happy doing that? Is that do you do you love it? If you love it, you don't care what other people think or are going to say. Um, and the. Uh, the fact that you know not everyone, not every single economist uh, is gonna value what you do, um, you know, that's that's life. You know, if, if you were a, pro a project designer, if you were, if you're a fashion designer, you design some like dress. Not everybody's gonna like your dress. It's fine. You know, you don't, you don't need everybody to to to, to buy it. Um, I think it's just there's heterogeneity in preferences in taste, and that's okay. Like. Uh, the 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 obviously you know the there's been a recognition over time as to the importance of the type of work that development economists do and you know the Nobel Prize last year was um, amazing in the sense that not only it recognized something that many economists still feel like you know is is is, is uh, too um, cheesy <laughs> for economists. It actually recognized it super early. I mean, that's, you know, I knew that the, these guys were gonna get the Nobel Prize. Um, there was no doubt about that. What made me extremely happy is that they got it early. They got it, you know, they, 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 you know, they didn't have to be, you know, 85 uh, year, year old to, to, to get it. They got it right away. And why? Because that's, you know, that's, you know, an amazing shift in the, in the discipline and, uh, and and they are gonna you know obviously as we we all know them they are gonna use this platform amazingly well um, so I think the the in some sense the the, the fight has been won uh, and there are still some people who don't um, value it but uh, the sense that this is something that matters for for the world is is um, is clear i think so just reminding yourself of why are you doing this for are you doing are you doing this because you want to that you want to shine are you doing this because uh you you want to kind of make a small difference um uh at a minimum and maybe a big difference if you're lucky and then i think it's 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 easier <laughs> to just ignore uh, I know you mentioned the Nobel Prize for a lot of us. It was a big moment that a female economist got as the youngest recipient. It was a big moment of validation for a lot of us. So yeah. you mentioned that 
like papers, uh, projects take a lot of time in the field. They take a lot of time to get published. So given that a typical project's life, life cycle lasts for about three to four years, how do you think an economist can influence policy on a more real-time basis? Um, well, I, so <laughs> there are, I guess there are, I mean, policies, you know, there's tons of policies, okay? So there are policies today that are in place, that have been in place for years, that are not based on any evidence, okay? Um, and so those policies are still gonna be in place in five years, in 10 years. And so if you sell a product now, that's gonna lead to insights in five years that, you know, uh, inform these policies, then, you know, at that time they can be changed. And so it's important to keep a long view to say, you know, if we don't get started now, uh, then we will never know. Whereas, you know, if, you, if we, if, you know, if we say, well, two years, you know, five years is too long of a time frame, then, you know, um, so for example, in 2008, with um, SLU friend Michael Kramer, we started a project in Ghana, trying to understand um, whether moving to free senior high school, free secondary education would be a good idea for the country. There was a lot of political debates about that. It was, we started in 2008, a study that was meant to, you know, we gave scholarships to people to go to secondary school for four years and then we we're going to follow them up, you know, for however long we can. Now it's been, you know, we're in 2020, <laughs> it's been 12 years. Well, you know, the, the, in 2017 is when the Ghanaian government um, adopted free senior high school. So by then, you know, it's been, you know, nine years of, of debate. Um, and by then we had uh, a lot of information that was extremely useful. Um, and now they are still debating whether to keep it or not. Each, each election cycle, there is more debates, and each time we can bring more evidence to the table. So, you know, when I wrote the first grant proposal for this, we initially got funded by, you know, the NIH. It was back in 2005. You know, I was still a PhD student. Okay. Now it's 2020. I'm a full professor. We've never published anything. We have one working paper that, you know, we are still <laughs> working on. Uh, like, Obviously, this is stuff that you know has absolutely no, no return in terms of like academic uh, career prestige. But we are all you know so happy um, to have been doing this study. I mean, it's like it's we are like a, a, you know the, in a kind of like an interlocutor for the for the for the Ghanaian education service, and uh, it's 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 you know really helpful. We know it's very helpful. Um, you know what what we've done, and we keep doing it. Um, so. If you tell yourself, well, it's going to take too long, I'm not going to do it, then, you know, 20 years from now, you still won't have the evidence. So these are for questions that are like, you know, policies that are deep, long uh, thing that change slowly, like education policy and stuff like that. Now, obviously, there are cases where, you know, the policy response seems to be super timely. And obviously, the COVID-19 crisis is one. Like, Right now, if you want to help inform governments as what to do and how to deal with the COVID-19 crisis, if you want to, you know, if you're going to start something now and it's going to take five years, that's not going to, you know, help necessarily. So, um, it's, it's, you know, then you need to kind of think of what, what can you learn uh, really quickly. Um, and I think development economists have done quite a good job at, at um, pivoting towards doing stuff that can be quite useful quite rapidly. So, because many of us um, have been doing you know, studies for a while and we have uh, samples, <laughs> I feel bad calling people samples, but this is like the technical term. We have you know, huge samples of people around the world where we have their contact information, often their phone number. And so a lot of studies pivoted towards phone surveys, um, either to get information about how you know people are uh, faring with um, the situation, and in particular, in, in, you know, as, as you know, uh, in India, but also in other contexts, the biggest hit actually came from the, the lockdown, the restriction. Um, that just like was a massive shock to people more than the actual, uh, you know, health uh, dimension. So just like being able to document the extent to which these restrictions are affecting people, who is most affected? If a government has a safety net program and cash transfers program, who actually gets it, who doesn't get it, who is left out, and that information can quickly be reutilized by, by government. Um, I've done some work with Radhika Jain, a postdoc here at Stanford, understanding the impact on non-COVID uh, healthcare uh, services. And here also we are in discussion with, a, you know, we are sharing our results with the uh, Department of Health of the government of Rajasthan in, in real time. So 
um, some of this stuff is not, you know, is not randomized, it's like purely descriptive. Um, but, you know, sometimes data about what's going on is what's the most important. And people, some folks have been doing randomized experiments of you know, how to best communicate the message, how do you best reach people, how, you know, do people, um, uh, you know, how do you get information across? Um, so, the, obviously, being able to do that requires having kind of an infrastructure in place and resources in place. And so that's kind of an, uh, an, an equal situation where the more the more senior uh, researchers in in, um, in the field are going to be much better positioned to do this type of stuff because we already have, um, you know, our eyes in place. We have money. We can kind of like move around. Um, or if we don't, we can apply for grants, and we're more likely to get them because there is name recognition. So this is, uh, you know, not everybody can, you know, as easily contribute. And as as young young scholars, what's important to um, really think about is that, you know, what if you want if you want to be able to to participate in this and you know, um, being part of a of a of a broader family, if I may say, um, is one way to go. So be like, okay, it's fine. You know, I can I can start. Uh, you know, I can work as an RA. I can um, I can try to join a, you know, a team um, to you know, do stuff. <laughs> before you can you know on your own uh, have access to the to to to, to the resources um, so. yeah so taking off from your response like the covid-19 marked a big shift for a lot of us economists like for our fraternity because we were forced to think more quickly we were used to like take a question and mull over it for many months if not years and spend a lot of time thinking about it carefully and now we were trying to sort of respond to the situation and I do think that our fraternity did a very good job of responding to it in the most credible way possible but do you think this marks a permanent pivot towards producing more rapid research quick turnaround research or uh, I mean it's not to say that the traditional way of doing research where we think about things for a long time will not be there, but a lot more of research would now look like uh, the sort of research we produced during the COVID time, uh, even after the crisis is hopefully over. Um, I, I, do, I do not know. I think it's a good question. Um, uh, I mean, so so one what um, one one thing in the COVID nineteen crisis that made all of this rapid uh, research possible in some sense is the kind of um, extremity uh, extremeness. I don't know what the word is. The you know you know massiveness of it in, because you know you all know. Um, what an identification strategy is and the shock of COVID being, you know, so big and the, the sharp discontinuities, if I may say, like, oh, you introduced a lockdown, you know, that's like, you know, you can plot the invent study graph, right? So I think it's, it's, it's maybe an exceptional in that sense. Like it was the type of shock that's, you know, the magnitude is huge. It leads to this extreme, extreme, you know, policy responses that, you know, by the extremeness are then kind of like relatively easy um, to evaluate in some sense so at least um, so I hope that we don't have any uh, more shocks of this magnitude anytime soon at some level I mean like <laughs> um, and so if and then you know so when you go back to like the kind of like more normal if I may say situation then you know it's, it's much harder to do things very rapidly because you don't have as you know um, obvious changes in the environment that you can look at. So, so that's you know just the challenges that we face typically, which require time and scrutiny. Um, you know, are still going to be there. Um, whether the you know the policy world will be um, wanting more you know rapid re uh, stuff. I mean, it, I, I think it's 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 unclear. I mean, one one thing that. Um, And one thing that I would hope happens is that um, the 
the need for really high quality uh, administrative data becomes very, very clear for everyone. And that's like pushes even further the move towards having that. So um, an example, like in California, there was this glitch in the system at some point uh, between, you know, end of July and early August, where suddenly the states like couldn't compute how many cases of uh, how many tests were positive or something. It was like, I don't know what happened, but like, so the counties suddenly, you know, were getting the information from the state. They didn't know. And so it was just around the time schools were supposed to reopen. And obviously they didn't reopen. We are all online. But, um, and it was like, okay, well, we actually, we don't know how many tests come out positive every day. And this is, it's, it was like, a catastrophe <laughs> for three weeks everybody was um so having systems that are really kind of like pro uh, you know uh, not error prone like that is very important and for countries who don't yet have um systems so in india for example it turns out that if you wanted to do the exercise that many other countries have been doing right now which is compute the excess mortality well it turns out you cannot because there's no you know we, we like there's no <laughs> you don't know how many people die every month for from which cause uh, in India, that's not that's not that's not there. Um, so maybe setting up a system like that is, is like super important because that's how you can see in real time what's going on. Um, so so that's one thing that I hope like you know that may make you know research um, easier and, and faster down the road if there's a huge push towards having better data management and monitoring system uh, for you know. So that that's one thing. On the other hand, um, some governments may strategically decide not to uh, invest in such systems because that uh, also put them on the spot. So there are a lot of political economic considerations there. Which is that, you know, now I realize, oh, you know, if I do a, a bad job, uh, uh, my policy response is, you know, not good. Everybody can see that very quickly. Um, maybe I don't, I don't, I don't want that. So there are already some, uh, and as you look at, I've been trying to look at that uh, with the student if you, there's this, um, very nice data that Google has been putting online, the Google mobility data, where you can download um, a CSV file where they put for every single day since, uh, you know, I think mid, uh, mid February or something for every country um, in, in the world and disaggregated by, you know, region, some index of how much people, are, how much people have been moving. Um, and so you can very easily see the, the lockdowns and the restrictions, but you know, it, it's all relative to the base of January, but you see the big drops in, movements and it turns out that some countries that are not in there uh, and one country in particular that i've been working on um, for some other stuff is ethiopia and it's not in the database and it's not a coincidence <laughs> um obviously many people in rural africa do not have a smartphone this google mobility data is based on you know it's the same data that tells you there is traffic on the highway right um so so if not enough people have smartphones you don't have that but in Addis Ababa, there are enough people with a smartphone but it's just that the government can kind of like um, shuts down, uh, you know, the internet as soon as, you know, very regularly when they think that things are not going their way um, and just restrict, um, you know, uh, how much uh, data can be used externally. So you can actually see which, which and I'm trying to see if we can see how autocratic a country is from how good that data, <laughs> that data is. So, you know, the, the yeah, all this to say, it's, it's it's possible that more will be able to be done, but not every country will be happy with that. And so we also have to make sure that we keep doing um, the other stuff in the, in the areas where it's still going to be, you know, much more challenging to 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 do work uh, given the lack of transparency in the data. We, we still need to do the long um, the long term stuff. No, and in India, we're still like thinking about how to even think about mortality related to COVID. We don't have national registration of deaths yeah. and so on. So those are real concerns. And it's all of our dreams to have good functioning MIS data systems, but I guess that's a long shot. Um, so related to data, during COVID, a lot of us pivoted to collecting data over phone and so on. And we realized like, a lot of us were very reluctant initially and we thought that we can never administer these surveys over phone and now we're doing it regularly on a daily basis managing those surveys do you think in the future we would have a different um, norm of data collection where we might have a lean baseline but many rounds of phone based follow-ups and so on or that could be one of the pivots that would uh, probably help us do research at a lower cost but more effectively in the future 
Yeah, um, I think that it's, it's possible. I mean, the, in my own research in the, in the Ghana work I mentioned before with, uh, you know, Southern High School, we actually started implementing phone surveys um, back in 2015 um, because we needed to like check on our folks, you know, regularly, but they were all over the country and it was very expensive each time to go find them in person. And you know, in 2015, it was like, okay, let's try. And we we're so uh, unsure it was going to be a good idea. We we're like, okay. No. And, then, and then we did it and it worked well. And we're like, oh, that's so much cheaper. And then we would like manage to reach 85% of people on the phone. And then the remaining 15%, we would actually track them in person to make sure that we wouldn't lose them and bring them back to the sample. So, and so, so we've been you know, doing this ever since 2015 and it's been worked, uh, working wonderfully. So in other uh, countries, and I started doing phone surveys as well. Um, I mean, it's, it, the main constraint is that th this service has to be short uh, because you know, people's attention on the phone is, is limited. And then obviously there are some measurements that you cannot do. If you want to measure a child cognitive development, you cannot do that on the phone. If you want to um, have people do uh, fancier stuff. So, so it, it, it's a constraint that you can do, but in terms of uh, a sh short module to look at, let's say, you know, the first stage, if I may say, you know, you do an intervention, you want to see if six months later people remember it or have learned what you wanted them to learn before you look at behavior. Um, then that's, I think that's something that uh, absolutely I see people doing uh, more and more. I mean, even before COVID, people were doing more and more. Um, and, and now uh, I think the, the, everybody will have realized that this is, um, this is a, a good way to go. The, the one, the, the one uh, question is whether um, attrition uh, after a while becomes high because obviously, um, you know, they like the it, it's harder to say no in person to somebody than uh, than on the phone, right? Like hanging up on somebody um, is remarkably easy. But if somebody has come all the way to your house and asked you very nicely to participate in a survey, it's, it's much harder to say no. I mean, obviously you should say no if you don't want your information to be known. But if it's just like it's a little bit of an inconvenience and you're a bit, you know, saying no is 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 hard in person, but easier on the phone. And so. Phone surveys in the U.S., for example, for polls or things like that, they have a very low response rates. Um, I think we've been lucky in um, with uh, in, in 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 poor environments that people are so amazingly nice. Yeah, you know, people are not rude. You know? <laughs> people are rude. People are not rude, and so it's amazing that you know you call people and they actually answer, and the refusal rates are very low. Um, which is like remarkable um, and, and, and you know extremely grateful to you know everybody who answers ever a survey that we ask them which is why I feel compelled to answer every single survey I receive by email or by phone um, and it's, you know a lot <laughs> but so so that's a, that's the question like will will there at some point be some um, you know if everybody does that all the time and if you know as you said people start saying oh well instead of doing you know one midline I'm gonna do like seven rounds of phones well, you know, the the if everybody does that, um, then it's gonna be maybe a lot of of on calls for uh, for respondents, right? Um, and obviously, the researchers are not the only ones who want to do this. Uh, obviously, there's all the marketers. Um, so they, I suspect there will be some um, you know, regulation uh, that's gonna become increasingly important uh, around these issues. Um, and and then obviously there's also and at some point, hopefully, the IRBs will also kind of pay attention to what it means to give consent on the phone. Um, you know, what, like, how can we be sure that the person has actually understood? Um, when you do face to face, you see the person is, you know, looking at you, paying attention. But on the phone, what if they are actually like dealing with a toddler having a tantrum? You know, and they put themselves on mute, so you don't know. Uh, but they didn't pay any attention to saying, and then they come back and say, "So is it okay?" And I say, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, yeah." <laughs> Not knowing what if just the players do. So, uh, you know, they, it, we have to be kind of ourselves, kind of uh, very, uh, you know, mindful of um, how we are using this tool in a way that's respectful um, of people's, you know, uh, <laughs> rights and uh, time. Uh -huh. Yeah. 
It's great that you touched upon it because almost on a daily basis, a lot of us who are doing phone surveys are grappling with the ethics of collecting information telephonically. What does con consent mean by taking consent on phone? Are we sure it's that woman who's giving the consent who's responding? So it's something yeah. we all try to think about every day. So it's really great that you touched upon it. So I have a question from Vishakha here in the chat box. Vishakha is saying, hello, Dr. Dupas. Do you think it's possible to have a fulfilling career in research, especially in development economics in isolation of academia without possibly doing a doctoral program? Uh, uh, so yes, I, I see so. Um, and because the, 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 you know, the, the, the model for how people do research has really changed in the sense that, uh, you know, if you're a researcher and you're not, you know, it's not like you, you're just, uh, you know, in, in your office with a library card and a computer. That's not, that's not how we do research anymore. It's really much more of a lab model. You know, if you're, if you're a biologist, you have a lab, you have, you know, a huge you know, space and like a, a, a tons of, uh, students and pre-docs and post-docs and uh, collaborators working with you. Um, well, in the social sciences now, um, it's, it's become like that and in development economics, maybe you know, earlier than even in other uh, you know, social sciences where, um, as I said, you know, I, started, I, I got into this by working as an RA in the field um, for, for, for Michael Kramer and Estelle Duflo. Uh, and, and at the time, the model was kind of you do the RA stuff for a year or two, and then you go to grad school, and then you become uh, somebody who you know herself hires RAs, and then so there's like countless generations. So like it's almost like Michael Kramer has like grand 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 kids from that scheme. <laughs> the RAs of my the, the RAs of the students of my students of you know this is like so, but. But more and more, actually, more, so more and more, some of the um, RAs that um, we had um, didn't go to academia and went on to a flourishing lives of their own um, in, 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 in making very, uh, you know, important, um, uh, I mean, doing research in a, in, a, in a way that's very impactful, but not through the academic uh, system. And so one example is, for example, um, ID Insight, which was created by, uh, you know, among others, co-founded by, by Paul Wong, who worked with us in Kenya uh, for a while back in, I think it was 2004, that he was uh, 2005. Um, and then he did, he did, he did um, the MPID at the Kennedy School and an MBA. So he didn't do a doctoral degree. Um, there is um, many other organizations, there's Evidence Insight, uh, there is um, Evidence Action, there is, um, uh, all sorts of you know organization um, that that uh, either kind of take proof take research at the proof of concept stage and then like expand it to be able to think about scale up um, or do kind of like faster space uh, research in direct response to requests from the government like ID Insight um, or uh, do you know there's I mean there are like tons of so so it's it's it's, it's the um, the amount of research that's done is much much greater than what you see you know kind of published in the in the economics journals um, and it's it's wonderful um, it's somehow the, the 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 when you are in the academic system you kind of miss on all of that amazing work that's being done um, and so that's why it's easy not to realize it's there. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's like another example of kind of the World Bank. I mean, uh, I guess many, many of the folks I know at the World Bank did, did do a, a doctoral degree, but they also have a lot of permanent staff that didn't do a doctoral degree. And, you know, there's amazing stuff um, being done by folks at the World Bank. I mean, they, they, uh, they do a lot of, uh, of original research and also review syntheses and, they have a uh, great impact on, on what governments choose to do. So I think there are all these different avenues and the, the, it's true that there is a little bit of a, of a picking order in terms of the seemingly uh, more or less prestigious stuff. And that's just, that's just rubbish. You just want to ignore that. Uh, 
the fact that you know you may do an amazing study and people won't know about it because it's not going to be published in the QGE. Um, don't worry about it because the people who won't know about it are the economists in the economics department and they, they don't make a difference in the world. <laughs> the people that you want to know about it are, you know, the government, the policy makers and, the, um, and, and, and they will know, right? So it's like, I think an average uh, World Bank work, working paper is probably read about uh, 2,000 times more than uh, an average paper published in an econ journal, right? So again, it's really thinking about what what you you know what what you want um, you want to do for, for me the reason why academia works well for me is really not about the publishing side it's really the, uh, but the training side I feel like I, the, the the one thing that I can do uh, in academia is contribute to training uh, grad students obviously also undergrad students um, and create opportunities for our students to uh, to work um, as RAs as um, and then as postdoc and and that I feel like it's like at least some of us need to do that uh, because that's that's that, that's also part of the. So, I but I get a lot of uh, joy when I see uh, former students, whether they are undergrads or grad students, go into um, these organizations. Um, I, I I feel like they, that's and I'm very proud of. <laughs> I mean, you know, if they go into consulting, I'm a bit uh, you know. Uh, bump that the talent goes to another area but if they go to anything related to development i'm like great uh, i've done my job so a lot of us here in this chat box today uh, a lot of our participants were women a lot of us are women of color a lot of us speak with an accent so could you reflect a little bit on your experience of being a non-american economist in American academia? Were there any challenges that you faced? Do you think these identities are relevant in this context today? And how would you suggest that a lot of us who would try and chart a career in that space deal with those issues? Um, so I think an accent uh, that I can speak to. <laughs> um, and it's that, that's that's a minor uh, that's a minor issue in the sense that uh, I mean at least for me what I realized is that the, when I start speaking the first three minutes people are not used to my accent and so they they are confused and so that's why I always when I start I always have slides that almost like say exactly you know exactly what I say is on the slide and what they can like learn you know um, <laughs> They learn the process of like matching the words to the sound, <laughs> um, and then and then they're okay, and then they can understand. So I just I start speaking, I start slow. And I usually speak very fast, but then when I start in a new audience, I go slow. I get used to my accent, and then it's fine. Um, it, I've had a couple of students in evaluations, uh, you know, comment on my accent and saying it was super annoying, and I just you know ignore them. Um, you know the on. No, um, obviously, I mean, I'm, you know, being a a woman, um, I guess for me, because I was kind of an oddball in any case, because I didn't do the PhD in the US, and so I already went on the job market in the US from a weird position. I was doing um, RCTs. I, th I think I may have been the first person to go on the job market with an RCT in development. <laughs> um, and so that, so I, I was already kind of like a really odd um, person. I was, there were so many things about me that were different, you know, um, not coming from the normal thing, doing some, you know, cheesy things. But on top of it was about HIV and sex. And so I, it's almost like the fact that I was a woman was, was, you know, I didn't, I didn't ever, I didn't think of that as, <laughs> as being um, uh, the most salient, uh, the most salient feature about me. Um, but then obviously once I was, and, and, and I guess my first job was at uh, Dartmouth College, uh, which is the most wonderful department in the universe, and um, which had already had a great gender balance uh, at the time. At least the people were like very, you know, active um, in everything. There were a lot of women. So I, I it was kind of a non, a non, a non uh, issue for a while, but then you know, then then I um, 
you know, and then I'm, I moved to places that were much less uh, gender balanced. And uh, we also, you know, I realized the student body was not gender balanced. Um, and then there are a number of occasions where I would realize, oh, okay, um, I'm the only uh, woman in the room, and clearly I have a perspective on things that uh, doesn't seem to be reflected in the current discussion. Uh, and the yeah, it, it, you know, the, the, I, I, I guess um, I've been you know somewhat lucky uh, that I feel like whenever I felt um, something was not all right and I raised the issue, um, I got encouraging <laughs> responses, and um, so I never I, I felt like. Uh, speaking up was um, a way to to help um, everyone realize um, that we can do better. Um, and so, when when the first time you speak up, you you know it doesn't create a, a bad, but it creates good. <laughs> then it empowers you to speak up more. So I, I was uh, I was lucky to be in a situation where. Um, Whenever I raised concerns and raised issues, uh, you know the counterparts I had were uh, willing to listen and to to do their best. Um, so I think that's what uh, yeah. So so that, I mean, and and unfortunately, if I may say, I think most of the women who've kind of had the uh, were you know been kind of successful, if I may say, um, have had that luck which is unfortunate in the sense that that means we don't actually have a lot to say. It's not like we can give advice or anything like that. I mean, that's, I really don't, I mean, I think luck is such a big part of it that it's very difficult to, to even think about how to go about that. Um, what I've been trying to do now, you know, since I'm in, 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 a, in a position where I can help others is to, uh, you know, seek out, um, when I feel like someone has something to say, but they may not feel comfortable that they can say it, I try to actively, um, you know, seek them out and then, you know, do that uh, with them or, or for them. Uh, and so, I, the one, maybe if I can say, I don't think it's a piece of advice, but the one thing I would say is that trying to find allies um, so that you know when, when, so, so that you feel safe, um, you know, speaking up. Is very important because if, if if you if you you know if you I mean it, it's all about the interpretation, right? Um, you can say the absolutely right thing, but then it, it it falls in the wrong ear, and then it's gonna be like turned around, and 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 it's gonna become some you know horrible fight, uh, and then it's 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 very difficult for everyone, and especially for for you and and. Um, and it doesn't get anywhere. Whereas if you know you kind of find the right set of ears to start, it's almost like you you know the. Um, I mean, it's 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 not great because it means that radicalism <laughs> may not work. Uh, I think that's the one thing that I feel like may unfortunately be true that you know we can't be too radical because then it just we just get um, so much antagonism, and so it's more like you know incremental. Uh, Pace, but uh, I think that I'm comforted by the fact that the you know younger generation uh, of, uh, of scholars, especially uh, you know male scholars, seem to be you know, much more receptive and uh, understanding and supportive. Um, so yeah, I, I'm hoping that uh, <laughs> things will get uh, easier. But um, yeah, I'm 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 afraid I'm not I'm not very we're very grateful to senior economists like you and many others who have raised their voices when they felt uncomfortable and have sort of paved the way for us when we like move ahead in the discipline and like and i know when i say this for myself i'm saying this for everyone in the audience we're also all very grateful for our wonderful female mentors who sort of gave us that space and were our allies when we faced issues and like yeah so that sisterhood is great um, so a lot has changed in economics in the discipline. You mentioned that we have a lot of younger, a lot of uh, like male colleagues who are more supportive, more receptive, 
are more sensitive and a lot is changing. We are having discussions around gender. The fact that we could have this conversation is something that we couldn't have done 10 years ago. We're having discussions around race. We're having all these important discussions and looking inside and thinking about our discipline and also about how we interact with the policy world. So what are some of those things that you're hopeful about? And what are some of those things that you think are still important challenges that we need to keep in mind and be cognizant of when we interact with our peers, when we do any work in the discipline, when we go out in the policy space? Um, so the, the one thing that I'm a little bit worried about is that the, the system to, to to get into you know this um, business, if I may say that that uh, that we are in, is still very codified in some sense. And so, I feel like to really uh, diversify, um, you know, the pipeline, as people say. Uh, let me just close the blinds. You know, the light is. <laughs> um, so uh, to really diversify the pipeline and to to, to really like broaden um, the 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 our world, <laughs> um, we need to really change how we, we recruit. Uh, right now, it's like, you know, the, the new thing is having pre-docs, you know, at universities, but like who gets the pre-doc, you know, obviously it's not, it's not the, and then the pre-docs want to you know, take graduate classes and then you may, some of you may be pre-docs and you may really want to take credit classes. I, I, I don't think it makes sense. I don't let pre-docs take my graduate class. I'm like, you do the graduate class when in grad school. If every pre-doc do, does graduate work before they do the graduate work, then what do they do in graduate? No, it's like, it's like an, an unraveling of things. Like, why not do the PhD class when you're in high school? When you are, it's just like it's like we just need. So, I feel like it's everybody. And then the professor like, no, but if I don't take the class, I won't get into the program. And I'm like, no. But then like, how, like that's that doesn't you know. So it's, it's like this rat race. Um, it's I feel like each time we find a new way to kind of like uh, expand the reach, then there's some like new you know way that um, mm -hmm. people who are better connected uh, manage to, 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 to get in first place. And so I think we need to completely revamp how we do you know admissions at all levels. You know? um, and for once, I think uh, if you know a program is oversubscribed, you know, having a randomized assignment would be a great way. I mean, it's like, it's, why not have a lottery, you know, like, so, you know, there's tons of people who will be extremely talented and uh, we should just, you know, uh, and, and that's also a way we will actually, actually be able to learn, you know, because right now we have very, we have almost no way of learning. We have this, and I've never been on the admissions committee at Stanford, so I, I it just, uh, you know, because I think it would drive me crazy, so, <laughs> um, because I would be bound by all these rules and, uh, but I think that there is no way to learn because it's not like uh, they keep track of you know people who are admitted, people who are not admitted, and then see over time you know what characteristics seem to predict. I think if we try to run a regression on success uh, in terms of, I mean, we would also have to argue about how we define success, right? But uh, uh, obviously, the, when it's success on the first year, you know, uh, exams. But you know, who cares about that? It doesn't predict how you know much you're going to change the world. But imagine you had a measure of success in grad school, and, and we should try to re regress that on stuff in the application, right? But no one is ever doing that, and most likely nothing would come out anyway. Um, so that's the one thing that concerns me: that you know, th there are ways to to do admissions um, at the uh, undergrad level, at the grad level, at the pre doc level. Um, that's so codified. I mean, and it just, it's just very hard to know because, I mean, as when you're on the recruiter side, you know, you get thousands of applications and you need to be able to screen, right? So people use like shortcuts. They use the GRE score, they use this and that. And, and, and that's just, um, you can you understand both sides and you understand why they do that. So like you need, <laughs> you need to, to, to pare down the um the pool but uh I'm, uh yeah so i'm i'm worried it's gonna take quite uh well maybe that's where we need to be radical that's where we need to um so i've you know I've, uh, i'm gonna i mean i try to push on that uh more i mean you know just this one department doing it's not gonna go anywhere but at least at the you know at the pre-doc level that's something that i want to try to do with the director of the king center at stanford which is a new role i have for two days now um, I'm going to try to have like a radical way of thinking about a pre-program, which will be bringing people yeah, who, yeah. you know, you know, the, the least the least recommendation you have from someone I know, the more likely you are to come <laughs> to get. And that's what I want. <laughs> um, but but so 
so we, I mean, uh, so it's going to be small scale. I mean, maybe maybe it can um, it can it can pick it up. Um, but yeah, let's um, let, let's hope I'm wrong and that things change much much faster. Um, Looking forward to all those experiments that you do at the King Center and learn from them. So we've had you already for over an hour. So I'll ask one last question that Aditi asked. She is a PhD student at University of Georgia and then let you go. <laughs> Aditi is asking that after uh, Dr. Banerjee and Dr. Dufa received uh, and Dr. Premer received Nobel Prizes, RCTs have gained exponential prominence. So she's basically asking that, what do you think the next advance in econometrics is going to be within our subdiscipline? Are we going to pivot towards uh, machine learning? Like, is the machine learning, do you think that's going to be the next big thing when we're thinking about doing uh, econometrics within development? Um, so I, the the I think there is already a bunch of work uh, on on that. Um, there is. I think the one the one key um, yeah one one key lesson from all of the RCT work that uh, that, that Kramer Banerjee Duflo have been doing and one one of the things that they say all the time is that there is no there is no silver bullet, uh, and I think that's true for you know policy and I think it's true for uh, tools as well <laughs> and economic tools. So I don't think that you know AI is going to be you know a silver bullet either. Um, I do think that. Uh, having much better administrative data is going to allow for faster uh, research uh, at scale and where, where, where I see that I, I, where I hope um, that the you know the the, the Nobel Prize um, uh, kind of you know, aura is gonna help make headways is in convincing more governments that it makes sense um, to 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 learn from what they do much more, and then they can do that relatively cheaply if they are you know smart about using their own data, uh, and that they can also experiment, if I may say, um, in a good sense of the term, uh, fairly easily at scale. Because you know, so your, your government, you want to start something new, you can do kind of like A/B testing relatively easily. Uh, in, in the short run, so that I think I, I would be really happy if that that happened. It's like still kind of you know it's still in the prolongation of the you know of the you know experimental um, stuff, but it like combines that with um, you know new streams of data. And so the admin data is one, and with AI you can transform other streams of data into useful stuff. So if you can put you know use AI on you know cell phone records or AI on satellite imagery and AI combined with, um, uh, you know, remote sensing and all of that, then, then you can actually uh, learn a, a lot. And you know, obviously one area that's very important uh, for more work to happen in is um, climate change. Um, and so that's really one where, you know, what you can do with RCT is maybe relatively limited. What you can do with traditional data is limited. And that's where maybe we may be able to do considerably more if we uh, do a big push uh, on, on on measurement and at scale um, uh, experimentation with governments. Yeah, definitely. Like thinking about all these challenges, we'll have to like take help from all kinds of data, from qualitative interviews to large scale data. Um, I promise that that was the last question. I have one last question for you. What are you reading right now and what would like what, what book would you recommend for us to read right now, given that we have a lot of time on our hands and we're not going out or anything. So what would you recommend us to read right now or a podcast that you're listening to that you recommend for us to listen to? Um, okay, so I, uh, there are a couple of books that uh, I've, you know, I, I think are absolutely wonderful books uh, to read. I mean, some of them are not easy, um, but they are. I, 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 you know, I read them, some of them recently, some a bit long, more a long time ago, but they are stuck in my mind. So one is um, uh, called "A Man of Good Hope" by Johnny Steinberg. Um, he's a historian, journalist from South Africa, and "A Man of Good Hope" is about the story of a. Um, 
of a refugee uh, from Somalia who makes it all the way down to South Africa. And uh, it's heart wrenching, but and, um, a true story, but it's extremely well done uh, and very insightful on so many fronts. Um, there is also a book um, uh, that uh, I read um, recently that uh, has nothing to do <laughs> with development, but that was, I thought was amazingly, uh, I mean, I learned a lot from reading it, which is um, called The Road, the Road to the Deep North. Uh, and now I, I blank on the name of the writer, uh, but I can send that over by email if you want. But it's about, um, it's about Japanese uh, war crimes uh, in, um, in East Asia. Um, and uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's, um, it's horrible. <laughs> um, I didn't know enough about the history before, so I learned a lot, but it's just like, so, so it, 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 I'm sorry, because all the recommendations I have are about the books that um, kind of talk about um, really difficult periods in human history, some very recent and some uh, longer ago. Um, but that I always find, like, it like, reminds me of how easy it is for anybody uh, to kind of like become a monster in some sense. Because if you think of a you know, Japanese soldier during World War II, it's not like they themselves, you know, got up in the morning saying, I'm going to become a monster. But then the system can make people uh, become uh, very bad. Um, and so, like the, the the fact that that also always makes it to, uh, very clear to me that uh, the type of environment that people are put in, the institution that we have, the the the, the, the way we you know choose who our leaders are, like so important in in terms of of, of history. Um, so I have actually I have a, a whole list. Uh, if you want, I can send it because I won't remember all the the, the names on top of my head. But one thing that's more fun, uh, a book that I think is really fun. It's a Nigerian uh, novel um, that is, um, uh, the name of the author is Nwobani, uh, N-W-A-U-B-A-N-E. And the title is, um, I Do Not Come to You by Chance. And it's uh, super funny, it's written in a very super funny way. Um, and it's about some scammers in Nigeria who are doing, you know, scamming people over email. And so it's like super funny to see that part, but it actually is very um, insightful in thinking about the, uh, you know, family obligations and uh, and struggles um, in Nigeria. I had so much fun reading it. I highly recommend it. Um, it's not as 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 dark uh, as the other the other recommendation. Um, right. I can send more. Yeah. If you have more, then yeah, please feel fair to share them with Prina rather than yeah. We all are in a on a lookout for a good reading list nowadays. So okay. Um, um, Prina, do you want to conclude? Sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, thank you, Professor Dupa, for uh, sharing your thoughts with us and for that refreshingly honest and open conversation. And um, thank you, Madhulika, for guiding the conversation so well. We're very grateful that both of you could take our time for this. And thank you, everyone, who dialed in and everyone who sent questions. Basically, I mean, thank you, everyone. And we're all very grateful as we grow as a, not exactly an organization, but as community, the type of support that we've been getting really reinforces why we set up this group in the first place and we're so happy that we can have conversations like this and learn from each other and um i mean follow us on twitter if you want more updates on future sessions newsletters and things like that and yeah thank you if anyone has been parting words and is better at being emotional than me then feel free to say anything thank you so much for having me it was an honor Thanks a lot, Prerna, for organizing this. And thanks a lot, Dr. Dupas, for taking out your time. We had a lot of fun. Okay, thank you. Bye, everyone. Have Bye. a good day slash good night. Good evening. Bye-bye. <laughs>